So I just want to start by saying, obviously, I'm presenting today, but as with all of these things, um, this is a team effort. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging the, the great team that I've worked with, um, Elena, Deborah, and Carol. We had a brilliant advisory group as well on the topic. And I'd also want to say thanks, obviously, to the IAS for the small grant funding um, that supported this work. Um, I'm going to start by explaining why we were interested in looking at um, alcohol marketing to sexual and gender minorities in the first place. And I'm sure today's audience is probably well aware of alcohol's contribution to the global burden of disease, to societal costs of alcohol use through financial impacts on public services and on the economy. But as you may expect, those harms are not shared equally amongst the population. And some groups of people experience more alcohol alcohol-related harms than others. And that health inequality includes those who identify as sexually or gender diverse. Um, by that term, I mean people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer, but it's not limited to that. And I'm gonna use the terms uh, sexual and gender minorities and LGBTQ plus to denote that umbrella of different identities during that talk, this talk today. It's well established now that sexual and gender minorities drink more on average and are at more at risk of experiencing alcohol-related harms compared to cisgender heterosexual counterparts. So for example, previous research has demonstrated an increased risk of alcohol dependence and a greater likelihood of drinking over the national guidelines for lesbian, gay, or bisexual people, alongside more frequent alcohol use with increased reports of daily drinking among LGBTQ plus people. And if you want to read a bit more about that, I would recommend this excellent report from the IAS, which was published a couple of years ago, and it starts to set this out in more detail. But the picture is a bit more complicated than it first appears. Grouping all gender and sexual minorities together can mask some of the important differences between those unique and very different identities. So, for example, there is emerging evidence of greater differences in alcohol use among sexual minority women compared to heterosexual women than in sexual minority men compared to heterosexual men. In addition, younger sexual minority women under 40 appear more at risk for heavy drinking compared to older sexual minority women, although drinking doesn't decline as sharply with age as it does for heterosexual women. We can also start to see particular impacts for bisexual people when we disaggregate sexual and gender minority identities. So for example, this study from America reported people who identified as bisexual were more likely to have severe alcohol use disorders than those who reported exclusive same-sex behaviors. This review looked at literature from between 95 and 2020 focused on bisexuality and alcohol use. They concluded overall prevalence of alcohol use was higher among bisexual people compared to either heterosexual or gay counterparts, and that the differences were actually um, higher amongst um, bisexual women than uh, compared to bisexual men. For younger people where overall alcohol use is decreasing, there remain disparities between heterosexual and sexual minority youth, uh, with lesbians and bisexual females continuing to display elevated alcohol use behaviours compared to heterosexual females. And finally, evidence for transgender people is less common, but it is out there. Um, a higher prevalence of binge drinking amongst transgender adults compared to cisgender adults has been reported. And the data also suggests that maybe trans men may be at an elevated risk of developing an alcohol use disorder compared to trans women. There's also uh, limited evidence that people who identify as non-binary or who are gender non-conforming have higher levels of binge drinking than either of the two transgender subgroups. So all of that, I hope, illustrates that this is a very complex picture, but it emphasizes that sexual and gender minorities are more likely to use alcohol, to use it to excess, and are more likely to experience alcohol-related harms. The obvious question after that is why? Um, and there's a body of work that has looked at this. So minority stress theory has been widely employed to explain how alcohol is used to deal with stresses related to stigmatization, victimization, and discrimination. So I suppose in short, alcohol is used to cope by sexual and gender minorities, but that's not the whole story. So further research has demonstrated 
the normalization of alcohol within social settings and explained how um, perceptions of community drinking norms can subsequently drive consumption. So if, if we're under the impression that heavy alcohol use is commonplace among our peers, then we're more likely to increase our own consumption. Alongside that, the importance of alcohol in relation to identity construction has also been explored for sexual and gender minorities. But what we know much less about are those upstream factors that might contribute to increased alcohol-related harms amongst this group, so those commercial determinants of health. And that's where our focus on alcohol marketing has come from. So as we know, marketing serves as a way to normalize and encourage alcohol consumption. And the relationship between exposure to marketing and alcohol use behaviors has been demonstrated repeatedly. So higher exposure to marketing is positively associated with alcohol use initiation, with increased consumption and increased binge or hazardous drinking. A lot of that work, almost all of that work has focused on young people to date but there is emerging evidence of similar impacts on other vulnerable populations, such as people at risk of or who have an alcohol use disorder. Of course, we're all exposed to alcohol marketing every day, but the practice of targeting particular groups of consumers through various marketing techniques may increase the effect and therefore the negative outcomes, which is where our scoping review comes in. So we wanted to know three things. We wanted to know how do alcohol companies target gender and sexually diverse communities? Um, in turn, what effect does that have on drinking practice? And then what are the potential implications of all that for UK regulatory codes and policy? So what did we do? For our, sorry, for our review, our population of interest uh, included individuals who identify within this broad church of sexual and gender minorities. So as I've mentioned, this includes anyone who identifies as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender or queer, but also other identities, non-binary, asexual. The list is, is quite long, so it's actually easier to identify specific exclusion criteria. And we didn't include publications in this review that focus uh, solely on cisgender heterosexual participants and articles that didn't include separate discussion of data from sexual and gender minorities were also excluded. The key concept for this review is alcohol marketing and we understood that as a range of strategies falling within the four P's marketing mix. So it included but wasn't limited to um, traditional and social media advertising on the commercial gay scene, brand associations, product placements, event sponsorship. Um, we excluded publications where the marketing of alcohol was conflated with other substances, which most frequently tobacco, um, but there was no separate discussion of alcohol related data. And what types of publications did we include? The aim of a scoping review is to map the body of existing evidence, and we wanted to reflect that in the broad uh, reach of articles and types of sources that we included. So for this scoping review, we considered both quantitative and qualitative research. Uh, we looked at case reports, peer-reviewed editorials, opinion pieces, scholarly writing, uh, book chapters, preprints, reports, theses, all these different things, if they met our inclusion criteria. And here's what we found. So we searched a range of academic databases and websites. Um, we scanned the reference list of all included articles for further um, studies, and we checked citations of all included articles on Google Scholar. Um, we included literature published in English since 1980, uh, really because we recognized the fact that this was not a new phenomenon. Marketing, alcohol marketing to this particular group isn't something that's happened in just the last few years. Um, we didn't appraise the included articles for quality in line with recognized guidance for scoping reviews. And the list of identified literature was passed to our study advisory group who kindly looked through that and made further suggestions. And we also sent it to other key experts in the field. So after all that, what did we find? Uh, we ended up with 14 articles in, uh, in total. And you can see from this, they span uh, 28 years. So from 94 to 2022, we included seven primary research uh, studies, three reports, three peer reviewed scholarly essays and one book chapter. 
From this, though, I don't want to give the impression that the literature was particularly extensive. For many of these included articles, alcohol marketing to sexual gender minorities was not the primary focus of um, the study or the, or the um, literature. And so the relevant content within each of those included articles was sometimes fairly limited. So returning to our questions, our first question was, how do alcohol companies target uh, gender and sexually diverse communities? And to answer that, we performed a thematic analysis, which identified three key themes, and we called them moving with the times, exploiting the scene, and performing solidarity. So I'm going to take you through each of those in turn and talk you through what we found, um, but also with a few additional examples along the way to help illustrate um, the points we're making. Just have a drink. So we'll start with moving with the times. And this theme really embraced the wide date range of the included literature. And it allowed us to explore how strategies to target uh, gender and sexual minorities have evolved over the years. So in socially progressive countries, increased awareness and acceptance of gender and sexual diversity has nurtured these commercial ambitions to tap into this market. So opportunities to harness the pink pound, and by that I mean just the spending power of gender, uh, gender and sexually diverse people, has been buoyed by this sociocultural change, um, reducing fears of products being stigmatized by being associated with this group, and therefore lessening commercial barriers to attracting those consumers. Saying all that, it makes it sound like the world is now obviously a wonderful place for sexual and gender diverse people, but I suppose an important point to make right at the start of this is while this is in theory a global review, we didn't have any limits on where the literature could come from, LGBT rights are obviously far from homogenous and our findings and our discussion today relate predominantly to socially progressive countries. And there's various ways of illustrating that. For instance, this is a map uh, which shows worldwide legislation regarding same-sex sex, marriage and expression by penalty or expression. So broadly speaking, countries in the warmer colors penalize and restrict LGBT people. So our discussion today probably has little relevance to fairly large sections of the globe. Further limiting factor to the generalization of our findings is all the included literature was just from three countries. So from the USA, from Scotland, and from New Zealand. The historical importance of print media for access in this market became clear in the literature. So print media has offered direct access to sexual and gender minorities for over 40 years, um, with alcohol advertising appearing in both local and national lesbian and gay publications, initially in the US, but then further afield. The advocate here is the oldest LGBT magazine in the USA. Uh, began in 1967, which was a couple of years before Stonewall, and it's still going today, still um, in a print version and online. And The Advocate has accepted advertising revenue from the alcohol industry um, since early in its history, and the adverts it featured were aimed specifically at gay consumers. So this is an example from its back cover in 1986, um, which is a celebratory artwork by Keith Herring, who was a well-known gay subway graffiti artist. And of course, The Advocate isn't the only publication where one goes, others follow. And they attracted the same marketing strategy and often identical adverts. So the absolute Herring advert was still knocking about in 1992, and it was found on the back cover of this um, edition of Out magazine. Targeting particular audiences via print media also presents the possibility of intentionally or unwittingly influencing editorial control. So limiting focus on detrimental impacts of substance use within those populations. Laurie Drabble noted this in 2000, saying a San Diego community assessment found high rates of alcohol ads in local lesbian and gay publications, but very little coverage of alcohol and drug problems. The focus nature of print media has made it a preferred option for advertising alcohol to LGBTQ plus people, eclipsing the use of television until relatively recently. As TV was presumed to attract uh, broadly cisgendered heterosexual viewers, 
And while I'm saying that, I'm making that assertion based on what we found in the data. There were no specific examples of this hesitancy of the alcohol industry to embrace television to target this group. But there are useful examples outside the literature, which hopefully illustrate the point quite well. So, for example, Beck's Beer were the original sponsor of the UK version of Queer as Folk back in 1999. And they were the sponsor as part of a broader sponsorship deal to um, a younger demographic. So they're sponsoring lots of programs aimed at younger people. But they pulled out midway through the first series of um, Queer as Folk, citing a need to review their budgets and adjust the phasing of their advertising spend. This also coincided with the series showing a scene of a man who was under the age of sexual consent having sex with another man. And because of this, the um, campaign group Outrage called for a boycott of the brand by the LGBT community. That led to Beck's offering to sponsor the second series of Queer as Folk, which was an offer that was politely declined. More sponsorship and collaboration with other programs has subsequently been more successful though. So for example, RuPaul's Drag Race has been around in the US since 2009, and Absolute Vodka were the sponsors for many years. And the show featured tasks such as um, representing a flavor of Absolute Vodka in drag, they got the contestants to record adverts for Absolute Vodka. But there's limited discussion of this in the literature of how the use of television marketing has evolved in recent times. And I think more exploration is needed in this age of sort of on-demand watching to gain insight into how, how this has been incorporated into contemporary marketing strategies that target LGBTQ plus people. The time span of the included literature has also allowed insight into how more traditional marketing techniques, print media and television, have been augmented by new opportunities created by the digital age. There was, however, only brief discussion in the literature of overt targeting via social media, um, with that discussion limited to brands using posts to celebrate pride and to align to various um, LGBTQ plus campaigns. But the limited research, I think, possibly belies the importance of this strategy. This is an example from 2017. So Smirnoff started the hashtag choose love social media campaign, where they worked with a group of illustrators to raise awareness of the negativity um, and abuse faced by sexual and gender minorities online. So the brand invited followers to send them examples of negative um, abuse that they'd, be, that they'd received. And they worked with these illustrators to respond to that with either a humorous or a positive post, um, an example of which you can see here. So ostensibly Smirnoff were spreading love and combating homophobic trolling, but this campaign was launched in June, uh, coinciding with Prime Pride Month and the launch of a range of bottles designed to celebrate pride. So as such, that choose love hashtag more frequently seemed to celebrate the vodka brand itself. And that response to homophobic trolling took very much of a back seat. This campaign also demonstrates something else, one of the more subtle promotional techniques uh, employed on social media, which is that of user generated content. We know from research focused on gendered marketing that this content places alcohol at the heart of everyday life. Um, it normalizes a culture of social drinking. People use these social media platforms to enact versions of their life, um, which are often doused in alcohol. Research exploring these marketing strategies to research, uh, gender and sexual minorities is lacking, though. And this is of particular importance as much of this content falls out with any regulatory codes. All that said, the success of these digital strategies was unclear in the literature, desensitization to online advertising has also been reported. This quote from a, a study in New Zealand illustrates that well. They felt, the person felt they hadn't seen any of it. Um, they spent a lot of time online, but felt because they were oversaturated with ads, they had learned to um, filter everything out. So overall, whilst the included literature emphasizes this historical role of the print media, and it demonstrates this evolution to social media and digital strategies, there's limited insight into the, the diversity of those digital strategies 
targeting gender and sexual minorities, particularly in the present day. The next theme we called exploiting the scene. And the commercial scene, the commercial gay scene was a dominant focus in the literature, particularly venues for gay men. So the scene was portrayed as a safe space. It offered a focal point and a social hub for um, gay and broader sexual and gender minorities. And its significance made it attractive and an important focus for venue-based marketing. So drinks promotions were common with specific brands or types of drink, especially shots, often incentivized. And while some venue-based promotions appeared uh, relatively passive, such as happy hours or package deals, as you can see here, there were also more dynamic marketing strategies reported. So for example, some bar-based competitions and events with alcohol-related prizes encouraged active participation. Um, an example being drag bingo, um, but also moving alcohol physically closer to the consumers, often uh, via visibly sexualized staff, was also reported. This quote from a study by Carol Emsley in Scotland sums that up well. Examples of enticement to drink more in environments that, all re that were already alcohol saturated were common in the literature. And as were calls for more responsible hospitality, they were documented also over the years. The scene also presented something of a captive market because opportunities for socializing without alcohol were repeatedly positioned as relatively rare. This paucity of alcohol-free community spaces for sexual and gender minorities created an environment of restricted choice for people. This quote from a lesbian woman in Jennifer Fellner and colleagues study from America, just demonstrating the centrality of alcohol spaces to that community socialization. So in addition to capitalizing on the centrality of the commercial gay scene, the alcohol industry also exploited the scene, the visual elements of um, LGBTQ culture, the imagery, the iconography and the celebrity. So the literature suggested that historical adverts aimed primarily at gay men drew on images of stereotypically attractive men, naked male torsos, and known gay sportsmen and musicians to endorse their products. Here's an example. This is um, Bruce Hayes. He is a US gay Olympic swimmer, and he's seen here promoting Gore's beer in 2001. RuPaul crops up again here. She was promoting Bailey's in 1999. I struggled to find other images of the examples that were described in the literature, but you don't need to look far to illustrate this point. For example, this is Jason Lewis, who played Smith in Sex and the City. Um, Sex and the City, a show with a large gay following despite its reductive use of gay stereotypes. This image was originally created as part of an episode in 2004. He was a model in the show, um, and this was a storyline, but Absolute Vodka subsequently used this image as a real advert, which prompted the actor to sue. The literature here focuses very heavily on advertising to gay males um, using stereotypically attractive men with little insight at all into the use of sexualized imagery and celebrity endorsements to appeal to lesbian, transgender, or other sexual and gender identities. Unsurprisingly, the rainbow flag has also been appropriated by multiple alcohol brands within both advertisements and as part of product packaging, commodifying what has been a powerful symbol of the fight for equality since the late 1970s. Um, worryingly, the reported testimonials in the literature suggested that this simple strategy often reaped its intended rewards. In addition to the use of gay imagery, the adoption of colloquial language has, um, has also been employed alongside sexual humor and innuendo. In this example, this was not from um, the literature, but it illustrates it well. It's, I saw it in a pub a few weeks ago. Um, the beer's named Polari, after the slang used by gay men in the 50s and 60s to evade the, the UK's anti-homosexuality laws. The findings from the review suggest that visual cues within alcohol marketing of, um, often relied on cliched understandings of who gay men were, drawing on tropes of extravagance and campness and hypersexuality. And you still find this. So this is summed up by this campaign on the left, 
uh, created by David LaChapelle, who is a gay photographer. And in this image, you can see the um, absolute vodka bottle pretty much vomiting unicorns and village people and everything all over the place. Um, the tweet on the right, making good use of well-trodden sexual innuendo. It's also interesting to see the choice of images used on the Polari advert, um, arguably linking the beer with images related to sex. But gay images and ideas haven't always been handled in a sensitive manner. This is a short advert from 2006 for 42 Below Volker, um, which was widely criticized for its use of gay tropes and stereotypes, albeit used in um, a tongue-in-cheek manner. Calling all gay men. Put down your fluffy little dog and your fabric samples and mince your backless leather chaps onto the street. Join with other men who like kissing other men, united in fanciful dressed harmony. Because we, the manufacturers of 42 Below Vodka, want you to give us your mighty pink dollar. We don't care if you're the Indian, the biker, the cop, the cowboy or the construction worker. Whenever you're out cruising for casual man, man, rumpy, pumpy, we want you to wrap your manicured fingers around our fine product. Because at 42 Below Vodka, greed comes before conservatism. In an effort to prevent sexual stereotypes, this ad was run past two fags and a queer. Findings of the review don't always seem to align with what we see day to day, I think which speaks to the paucity of contemporary research. Um, for example, the reporter's reliance, as we mentioned, on extravagance and campness and hypersexuality is there, but it doesn't always ring true. It seems to be only part of the story. As an example, here's a selection of more recent print ads, and they seem to suggest representations of um, particularly gay male life science lifestyle seem to have become more nuanced and possibly sophisticated. Further exploration on the contemporary print, uh, nature of print and TV advertising to this group would help expand our understanding here. Our final theme is titled Performing Solidarity. So the sponsorship of annual pride events by the alcohol industry was repeatedly um, emphasized in the literature, particularly within North America. And at those Pride events, the visibility of um, on-site promotions, branding and banners embeds this perception of normative substance use, saturating culturally important spaces um, with messages about the importance of alcohol for the celebrations. And while Pride was the most ubiquitous, there were a broad range of events mentioned in the literature um, which attract this alcohol industry attention over the years going from sporting events to ski weeks. As a more recent example, um, this was the 2023 Aspen Gay Ski Week in the US, um, which is a huge event now in its 46th year. And this event counted no fewer than eight different alcohol sponsors amongst its official sponsors on its page. But it's not all big events. So smaller provincial festivals and parties have also attracted this sort of sponsorship. This is an example from Twitter last year, um, a local event to support trans visibility being sponsored by a craft beer company. And the tweet places the um, alcohol consumption at the heart of those celebrations. And this sort of funding was often framed as enabling in the literature, supporting the running and the ongoing survival of these cultural and social celebrations. But the dearth of other funding opportunities and of substance-free community spaces, as we've said, breeds a fiscal reliance on the alcohol industry, which ensures that alcohol promotion remained contingent to events uh, like this, to their event success. Other recent examples aren't hard to find. We have the uh, main sponsor for this year's British Film Institute Queer Film Festival in London was Campari and an official partner of uh, the Eurovision Song Contest in a few weeks' time is Bailey's. And obviously the, the Song Contest is a, a huge event with a large LGBT following. The sponsorship of these events presents opportunities for alcohol brands to convey camaraderie with the community and it positions themselves as allies and supporters of sexual and gender minorities, but doing so by placing alcohol at the heart of that support. And that sponsorship is complemented by industry patronage of particular organizations and charities. So again, Absolute Vodka have been a front runner in this field. They were early sponsors of Pride in North America. Um, they've donated money to HIV and AIDS organizations at the start of that pandemic. 
um, and a big funder and supporter of GLAAD, who are the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation in the US. But there are examples closer to home. This was um, a pub in London a few weeks ago. You can see the brewery here donates a small amount of money for each pint sold to an LGBT homeless charity. And another example I noticed in the supermarket the other week, um, the wine van Madame F, who support the charity art awards run by Queer Britain and therefore also brand their bottles with that charity's name. While seemingly philanthropic on the surface, perceptions of the motivations behind those sponsorships and donations reveal diverging narratives in the literature. So for some, alcohol industry alignment to sexual and gender minority causes was a positive thing. It demonstrated um, inclusion and acceptance. Just the fact that um, LGBTQ plus people were accommodated in the marketplace provided a sense of visibility and legitimacy and kind of detoxified communities that had often felt marginalized and vilified in the past. And these quotes sum that up, hopefully. But that was commonly weighed against this understanding of commercial gain. So this performance of solidarity was also constructed as simple promotion. It does more for the brand than for the cause. And allegiances to sexual and gender minority causes were commonly framed as rainbow washing or pink washing, this cynical use of immunity to manufacture an image that's only notionally endorsed progressive liberal values. So it's a show of solidarity rather than solidarity itself. And I think that strategy is exemplified by the example of Cause Brewing Company. So Cause have supported AIDS walks and benefits, they've sponsored Pride, they give uh, same-sex partners of employees in America spousal benefits, so um, health insurance and things like that. But while doing that, the Cause family simultaneously funded one of the United States' largest homophobic right-wing conservative think tanks. And critics have pointed out that their socially responsible corporate image has boosted sales that in turn actually boosts donations to right-wing oppression. And the case of cause is really interesting um, and it's divided the community as to whether they are actually doing a good thing. There is a really good blog which tells you much more about this if you're interested, um, which you can access here. Definitely um, recommend reading that. And it's very easy to be cynical but there's more going on here that isn't currently explored in the literature. For example, it's easy to frame this discussion around them and us, around the industry sitting apart from sexual and gender minorities, but of course those communities exist within the industry as well. So as an example on the left here is a tweet from Queer Brewing. Queer Brewing is a queer and trans-owned brewery in London. On the right we have Proud Beer. The story behind that is that the two um, people that founded it were sick basically of people slapping a rainbow flag on things once a year and not caring for the rest of the time. So they thought we'll start a company of our own and actually give um, LGBT plus charities money throughout the year. And there's many more examples of community owned and run alcohol companies, particularly in America. And the authenticity of that support can't be so easily dismissed. But how these companies and these brands are incorporated into into this story hasn't received any attention to date. There's other areas of marketing to this community that barely feature um, in the published literature that are clearly important avenues to explore. Um, I've shown one example, this example related to transgender people as we've gone along, but they're often lost in when with reference to LGBTQ plus communities in the literature, which actually only seem to mean gay men and lesbians. And there is a need to try and disaggregate these identities because the industry certainly does. So, for example, on Trans Visibility Day at the end of March, Absolute tweeted a short thread celebrating significant time points for transgender people with the hashtag, hashtag Trans Day Visibility, alongside hashtags of their own. And a very recent example you may have seen in the news, um, Bud Light employed the services of a transgender influencer, Dylan Mulvaney, to advertise its products in March. And that prompted a huge backlash from right-wing America. So from Republicans, state senators, popular musicians, all of them calling for a boycott of the Bud Light brand. Bud Light's response to that was to sack the marketing executives who had overseen that collaboration. 
distancing itself as soon as the going got tough. Of course, that's probably all generated much more publicity and brand recognition than the influencer would have done herself. Moving on very briefly to our second question, which focused on the impacts of these marketing strategies. And the answer to this is much more, much shorter. We just don't know. We only have anecdotal data and not much of that. Um, we don't know how this impacts drinking behaviors. But as I mentioned at the start, research with young people suggests it's likely to have significant effect, but further work is definitely needed to look at that. And finally, what are the implications for regulatory codes? Well, as we know, the market, um, alcohol marketing is self-regulated in the UK through industry-funded bodies. And looking at their codes, we can start to see where some of the practices that we've discussed may fall through the regulatory gaps. So, for example, while marketing communications that refer to sponsorship of events are covered by um, ASA codes, the event sponsorship itself isn't. The Portman Group does have a code of practice on alcohol sponsorship, and that seeks to ensure that alcohol sponsorship is done in a socially responsible manner, but how social responsibility aligns with active targeting of groups that experience disproportionate harms from alcohol use is unclear. And I think that highlights the emphasis self-regulatory codes place on the individual drinker. So um, putting responsibility at the point of consumption through drink aware messages, for example, rather than on the industry itself. Targeted alcohol marketing through these communities perpetuates a growing health inequality, but self-regulation self doesn't have that public health focus at its heart. There's further gaps. So for example, um, user-generated content only becomes subject to the codes if the content is incorporated into the industry's own marketing communications. So for example, if they like something or share something. So encouraging users to post a hashtag falls out with the code as long as the brand isn't seen to endorse it. The use of influencers, user-generated content, all of that side of things is particularly under-researched in respect to this community and more work is definitely needed there. Um, this is an area we're still thinking about. So if anyone has any thoughts around implications for regulation, um, we'd be interested to hear them. Um, I've gone on far too long, so I will stop there. Thank you. I was absolutely astounded that there's only research in three countries. And I think really strongly about, um, you know, thinking about Berlin, uh, Helsinki, you know, these major pride marches. Um, I wonder just to kick us off and please do feel free to ask lots of questions in the chat. Um, I'll call on you uh, in the order that they come through. And if you feel uh, you would like to, um, I will unmute you. But I wondered whether you would reflect, Dave, on why do you think other countries have not drawn their attention to this, particularly those who have, you know, so like the Berlin Prize has been going on since the 70s. Uh, Helsinki was 75, I think, you know, so there's been a long history. I wonder, could you reflect on why it's so concentrated in, in certain areas, if you could at all? It is strange. I suppose as well as being concentrated in certain areas, it's concentrated in certain researchers. So a lot of the, the New Zealand work is pretty much all done by one man and, and his team. <laughs> Um, the, the, there's a po pockets of excellence in, in America that are doing it and particular people in Scotland that are doing it. But it doesn't seem to be a widely researched area in terms of um, uh, people interested in doing the work. Um, I don't know if that's down to funding, maybe funding opportunities is more difficult. It's hard to get this sort of work and um, money to do this sort of work. It was, I know what you mean about the, it's, the, the lack of European research was strange. And I think with, um, I don't know if it's because it's been reported in America so, for so long. I mean, the, 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 a lot of the evidence around pride stuff comes from America, very little, a bit from uh, New Zealand, but very little from elsewhere. And I don't know if it's because people see this and they just assume the same is happening everywhere. It's, it's, it's been done, we know about it, move on. But I think the problem with it, and from looking at the, 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 the evidence through time, there's a real worry with that because obviously that video I played was in 2006. It wouldn't be played now that like we've all moved on, but 
it, there's an importance of keeping the research that we use up to date and and especially things like this where marketing moves on so so quickly as part of this we kind of had a little look at some of the trade magazines and the trade journals not to include in the review but just for a bit of context and it was you saw how quickly things were moving in that field and how slowly things are moving from an academic research point of view and also there is work there is stuff written about pride in europe and all the rest of it it's on blogs it's on community driven um community driven blogs and internet stuff so it's it's really difficult it's almost like as academics we are lagging behind but people know about this thing and so i think we have to be a bit more um, open to different sources of evidence that we sort of start to look at because there is stuff written about this but it's not what we would term academic quality stuff that you would look at intersectionality is a is a theory that i use in my work um, and so we do have some evidence that there's um, marketing towards black indigenous and latinx communities in the u.s and i was wondering if in anything that you saw was there any kind of mention of the intersection of the marketing um, that's targeted to people of color um, as well as lgbtq people and then lgbtq people of color um quite a short answer no <laughs> uh, when it, where the, where it was mentioned was as um parallels were drawn with marketing, with where how people have put up billboards in um, black neighborhoods in America and things like that, but there was nothing specifically that linked communities in that way within the literature. That's what I thought, but just just wanted to see in case. Thank you. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you very much. Great presentation. I'm sure everyone's going to say that because it was. Um, I work for OHID in the alcohol and gambling uh, evidence and delivery team. And one thing that I was wondering if this fell within kind of your inclusion criteria for searches, is any type of research analyzing kind of the strategic plans or annual reports of various alcohol producers or manufacturers in the context of kind of queer so, uh, corporate social responsibility work and their kind of wider approaches to marketing that they're engaging in or planning to engage in. Uh, so yeah, just if you've heard or saw of anything. Um, it's not a body of literature we looked at, but I, Amanda, who is here, that I, Jillian just mentioned, um, I think has all, has has spoken to industry and looked at that kind of of reports and trade um, literature. Hi, hello, um, thank you again. That was an amazing presentation. It was really clear. I was wondering if there was any comparison being done with events targeted at the general population, both as to what alternative non-alcohol based sponsors that there could be for LGBTQ plus events, but also to what extent is the risk that a sponsor is alcohol based much higher in the community than it is in the general population? It would be a really interesting um, thing to look at. Not to my knowledge that something like that's going on, but I'm, I am acutely aware when I'm saying all these things that there is no comparison. Mm, uh, so yeah. you know, I'm, I'm waffling on and saying that this is happening this is happening but and what is that any worse or better than other groups um i don't know and that that work isn't i've not found that work okay thanks a, a, a lack of stories uh, and whenever there is a story it's usually a negative one uh, back in history for for some kind of a, a dreadful event uh, and i was just correlating the two things uh, uh, musing away on the chat and then suddenly you're talking to everybody uh, it, it was an amazing presentation i found it really um uh, thoughtful. My, I'm, I'm left with thoughts. So I work in public health within Southampton. Uh, we've just recently produced a, a town strategy that identifies that people from all sorts of uh, different communities are not engaging in our drug and alcohol services, are not seeking support. Um, and so my, my the, the so what is, is my next bit after your beautiful presentation is so uh, what can I be doing about this to encourage people who may be um, more risk uh, to to get any help and support that they might need but but really fascinating more questions than answers but really brilliant thank you well um i know so elena demova who i can see who i know is here she's done a report on um barriers to accessing um, alcohol drug and alcohol services which you may have seen but she knows a lot more about this um, i can i can post up the report in the chat and have happy to be contacted and talk about this excellent. excellent my dear thank you so much um, a kind of a combo question with Frank Houghton and Corrine Gallopel Morvan. Um, you were talking a little bit about the sort of parallels to the tobacco industry. 
So Frank has asked you about whether you see strong parallels between alcohol industry and the LGBTQ plus community and the tobacco industry and the same. Uh, and Corrine was saying that, you know, the, the tobacco industry is really targeting LGBTQ plus people um, and whether you had looked at them or compared in any way the marketing of the alcohol tobacco industry towards LGBTQ uh, IA plus <laughs> how many letters we want to put in here <laughs> uh, in your research. Dave, I don't know. If you could so my that. answer is not yet, but that is literally that's my next, next week's job. Um, what we what we what we've discussed in our um, with the advisory group, which was really useful, was around this about tobacco. And it, my understanding is, um, in terms of regulation and research on that topic, so much further ahead. We know a lot more about how that works, and we're already um, ahead in terms of regulation and trying to combat that. And alcohol has lagged behind, um, probably from just from my understanding, is because of the social. Um, acceptability of tobacco is going down and alcohol is still a very social acceptable drug um it is a it's a there's a lot of literature out there it's something that i need to cover and will be reading about but i can't really speak much to it at the moment i'm sorry uh, yeah sure um thank you so much dave that was really thought-provoking and quite powerful um i just wanted to kind of suss out if there is any emerging evidence of kind of adverse health impacts of alcohol advertising i'm um, representing the british liver trust so i was wondering even qualitatively speaking anecdotally speaking if you're aware of um the kind of impact on alcohol related liver disease and just on that note if there are any specific barriers to seeking sort of help seeking for people with alcohol use disorder who are lgbt and maybe a mistrust distrust of healthcare professionals so in terms of the second point, I would refer you to the uh, Elena's report that she's popped in the chat there. The first point, I know I very much brushed over that at the end about whether what are the impacts, but within all the literature we found, there isn't any, there's no decent research. It's all very anecdotal. There's a bit of qualitative work where people say, oh, I may, yeah, it made me drink more, or the, but nothing that you can make any substantial um, conclusions around at the moment. It is something that's needed. The body of work that exists, as I said at the start, is mainly focused on young people and has been done on young people. And that evidence is clear, like the, the evidence is absolutely brilliant. But whether we can translate that to other populations, obviously there are gender sexual minorities within young um, populations as well. So, um, like yeah, to... it's needed. Hi, uh, yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask about the effect of the closure of lesbian bars that's been happening over the last couple of decades um, and whether that's corresponding then to um, the moving of alcohol consumption into the home and other spaces or whether there's been a reduction um, and what that might mean for um, showing the relative impact of minority stress and identity versus the space that itself. So there's been there was a couple of things that I, that, um, I thought of um, that appeared in the literature. One of the things was around the closing of lesbian bars, particularly in America, has almost um, uh, it's made the alcohol industry kind of sit up and they have almost taken on this cause. So a lot of the um, uh, the kind of the protests and all of that stuff against lesbian bar closures in America, some of it is actually led by and driven by the industry to keep these spaces open. Um, what was the other bit, sorry, Max? Um, just what that might mean for showing where, um, if there has been a change in, uh, in reduction or moving of um, consumption, what that means for how important the space is itself and the marketing compared with um, identity, stress, other factors? Yeah, the, the only thing I can think of at the moment is one of the included studies we had was from America and it was by sexual minority women over lockdown. So can, when people couldn't go to lesbian bars or their, um, their commercial gay thing. And they found the drinking, I mean, this obviously is all to do with COVID and lockdown as well, but drinking increased at home, essentially. They found they were drinking much more. People were drinking at all different times of the day. Drinking was starting earlier. Um, and whether, it's really hard to apply that to if bars are closing, what people are going to do, because there's going to be an alternative and there wasn't during COVID. But it seems to me from, from everything I've looked at, the drinking moves. It doesn't, it doesn't stop because the place, the space has ended. The drinking moves to somewhere else. People adapt and change um but there's nothing specific that i've read that could answer exactly what you're asking max i'm sorry 
Yeah, just a quick question from me. Thanks, Dave, for a really, really interesting presentation. Um, I was just wondering, obviously, you were saying that a lot of the, like when you're going through the ads, especially, that the, it's kind of focusing on really lazy stereotypes. And I was wondering if they're part, maybe part of the change here could come from the communities involved themselves and whether there'd been any black backlash to the kind of portrayal and the involvement of the alcohol industry in venues as part of sponsorships and, and that sort of thing. Um, we're, we're quite aware, you know, kind of anecdotally hearing from some of our supporters, obviously, about more sober spaces opening up for um, gender and sexual minorities and that sort of thing more recently. So I was wondering whether in your research you came across um, examples of where members of the community have gone like, we don't like this, or I've tried to kind of raise these issues as well. Yeah, um, no, but I, the, the, the discussion around the lack of alcohol-free spaces um, was recurrent in lots of the different topics. It, it was, there was nothing, um, it wasn't like anything written where huge groups of people had become advocacy groups and, and changed. It was more like individual qualitative um, comments about these are needed. Um, we don't have an we don't have any alternatives came up again and again and again. Um, and it's like this has been recurrently said, recurrently said, recurrently said, but it doesn't move on. The conversation doesn't move. So we know that these spaces are needed. Um, but what those spaces should look like, how we sustain them, how the community actually becomes involved, I think we still don't know enough about those spaces. We know an alternative is needed, but we don't know what that should look like, um, who, who to involve, how to sustain it, all those different questions that are really important to answer if there's going to be viable alternatives that people actually want to go to. Um, yeah, it was just really an observation. I suppose I was, I was listening to what you're saying about the impacts uh, of advertising uh, um, and how that can be measured in terms of harm. And it just, from my perspective, we're looking at doing needs assessments around harms and impacts of alcohol in our local authority area. And one of the things we look at is long term conditions associated with alcohol use, hospital admissions, and whether you, there's a way of segmenting that in terms of population intelligence. So whether you can measure that against the wider population or other communities. I'm not sure how easy it would be, that's the problem. I think because it's also about people self-reporting their identities and they enter the healthcare system. So is that going to be an easy thing to measure? Is it going to be realistic? But aside from that, I'm not sure how else you might be able to do it. Just, I'm just thinking it's a, a stream of consciousness, really. So I just thought I'd share that with you. I think it's important as well to touch on how we how we conceptualize harms you know we're saying that these during alcohol is causing more alcohol related harms and like you say it's it's things like alcohol liver disease and death and that but there are other important harms i think that are more difficult to quantify in thinking about how we can conceptualize harm meaningfully to the people involved sometimes those biggest facts and figures you see them and you go yeah yeah we know more deaths more da 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 da, da. but a more personal and more tangible um, kind of things to your day-to-day -day life can sometimes maybe be more meaningful to in terms of public health messaging and things like that I don't know